Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. We are uh, concluding Chapter 3 today with Section 3-3, three, uh, three, which is measures of relative standing, and that includes uh, box plots. A box plot is a type of graph uh, that shows some measures of relative standing. Okay. All right, so key concept, uh, we introduce measures of relative standing, which are numbers showing the location of data values relative to other values. Uh, the most important concept in this section is the z-score. Yeah, I guess I agree with that. Uh, percentiles and quartiles are important too. I actually hear people in real life sometimes talking about percentiles and quartiles, okay? All right, so let's start with the z-score. This is the thing that I kind of wished I had had uh, when we were doing that empirical rule stuff in the last section. <clears throat> a z-score, it basically in English, tells you how many standard deviations above or below the mean is your value, all right? So example, in case you just watched uh, the end of 3-2, this formula would tell me that an IQ score of 145 is three standard deviations above the mean, okay? Now we were able to figure that out without this, but the nice thing is that this uh, Z score can come out to a decimal. So if I had some weird IQ score like 132, uh, this would also work, okay? Uh, notice it's basically the same formula. It's just using the correct notation depending on whether you're looking at a sample or a population. So what you do is you take that value that you're trying to calculate the z-score for. Z-scores are for individual data values. It's not for a whole set of data. A set of data does not have one z-score. It's for each individual value. So you do that value minus the mean. That tells you how many points above or below uh, the mean are you, and then you divide by the standard deviation, uh, and that turns it into the number of standard deviations above or below. So the value minus the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation. Z-scores are generally always rounded to two decimal places. When we get to about chapter six, <clears throat> we're going to be using z-scores to sort of expand on the idea of the empirical rule. So instead of doing problems like how many values or what percentage of the values are within one standard deviation, we will be able to do stuff like what percentage of the values have z-scores between negative 1.32 and 0 0.83, okay? Uh, and we're gonna do that using a table and in the table, uh, all the z-scores are rounded to two decimal places. Okay. okay. Properties of z-scores. Uh, again, a z-score is the number of standard deviations that a given value is above or below the mean. Z-scores do not have units. Okay. So if my uh, mean is in inches, and my standard deviation is in inches, that formula is going to do inches divided by inches and your units just all cancel out. So it's what we call a pure number, the z-score. Um, again, you can think of it as the number of standard deviations, but it, it does not have units attached. Okay, and then, I think we might've talked about this before, uh, if a data value is more than two standard deviations below or more than two standard deviations above, we call that significantly low or significantly high. Or, or we just say unusual or extreme or something like that. And now that we know about z-scores, we can say that a different way. We can say if the z-score is less than or equal to negative two or greater than or equal to two then that score, that value is an unusually extreme value, okay? 
If an individual data value is less than the mean, then the z-score is going to be negative. So when you see a negative z-score, that means it's below the mean. Okay, okay so we're going to use z-score to answer this question. When I, I have to admit, when I looked at this example, I thought it was kind of a silly comparison. I don't know anybody who would compare these two things, but anyway. Which of the following two data values is more extreme relative to the data set from which it came? Uh, door number one is the 4,000 gram weight of a newborn baby among 400 weights with sample mean uh, 3,152 grams and sample standard deviation 693.4 grams. That's door number one. Door number two is the 99 degree temperature of an adult among 106 adults with sample mean um, 98.2 degrees and sample standard deviation uh, 0.62 degrees. Okay, so we're going to use z-scores to decide which one of those values is more extreme. And here's how that looks. Okay. Door number one, the 4,000 gram uh, newborn baby has this z-score. You do 4,000 minus the mean, which is 3,152. If you're putting this on your calculator, I just want to make sure everybody understands that if you're going to put this all in at once, you have to put this in parentheses. Okay. Otherwise, it will only divide the 3,152 by this number, and it will give you the wrong answer. Okay, so you do that calculation, and it turns out, <clears throat> excuse me, that the 4,000 gram uh, newborn baby is 1.22 standard deviations above the mean. Okay, that's door number one. Door number two, the 99 degree body temperature, 99 minus, that is a typo right there. Excuse me for one second, I'm sorry, I didn't notice that before. Ignore that three, please. That would not be a good body temperature. <laughs> Okay, uh, 99 minus 98.2, and then divide by 0.62. Again, don't forget the parentheses if you're putting it all in at once. It comes out to 1.29, so it's very, very close, but the 99 degree body temperature is just slightly more extreme than the 4,000 gram uh, newborn baby. And I think they say that on the next slide, let me just get rid of my scribble here. Okay, the 4,000 gram birth weight is 1.22 standard deviations above the mean. The 99 degree body temperature is 1.29 standard deviations above. It is slightly more extreme, that body temperature, than that birth weight. All right, I feel like we've looked at a version of this before. Uh, using z-scores to identify significant values. And again, I'm not crazy about that term. I prefer the term unusual or extreme. Uh, but anyway, uh, and they said this you know, like two or three slides ago, right? If the z-score is less than or equal to negative two or greater than or equal to two, then it is significantly low or significantly high. If it's between negative two and two, then it is not an unusual value. Okay, so I would not be surprised. Uh, well, like in the last example, right? 1.22, 1.29. Uh, the 1.29 was more extreme a little bit than the 1.22, but neither one of them would be considered extreme. Okay? When you take your temperature and it's 99 degrees, you don't panic, right? Okay, the lowest platelet count in a data set is 75. Platelet counts are measured in uh, thousands of cells per microliter. 
I think is what that says. Is that value significantly low if platelet counts have a mean of 239.4 and a standard deviation of 64.2? So this uh, seems like a good time if you're watching the video. I'll ask you to pause the video and try this one and then come back and we'll compare notes. Okay. So this is how that calculation looks. <clears throat> uh, when you convert that platelet count of 75 to a z-score, you do 75 minus 239.4, and then you divide by 64.2, gives you a z-score of negative 2.56. So that would be significantly low, right? Because it's less than or equal to negative two. Anything outside that negative two to two range is considered extreme. Okay. Yeah, again, since that Z score is less than negative two, it's considered significantly low. And then they just threw this in here for your information. A low platelet count is called thrombocytopenia. I actually looked that word up the other day because I was trying to figure out how to pronounce it. And then I forgot. All right. I think that's right. Okay, that brings us to percentiles. I enjoy percentiles. <coughs> so the first time that I ever became aware of percentiles was, you remember in school, they make you take those standardized tests. They sit the whole school down at once and they give you a bubble sheet and you have to answer a bunch of questions. And then at least back in my day, uh, about... I don't know, a few weeks later, my parents would get a report in the mail saying that your child is doing math at the such and such percentile and is doing reading at the such and such percentile. So, uh, for example, the 80th percentile, if you're reading at the 80th percentile, what that means is that you read better than 80% of the people who took the test and the other 20% read better than you do, or at least they did you know, when you all took the test, okay? So these percentiles uh, divide your set of data into um, 100 groups with about 1% of the values in each group. Uh, you would need a pretty large data set in order for this to work, all right? But that's what they're supposed to do, okay? All right, so uh, the first kind of problem they talk about is, let's say that we all come in next Tuesday to take our uh, statistics exam, and you get the exam back, and it says that you got a, an 85, okay? And uh, if I wanted to know what percentile that is, here's how I would do it. I would count up the number of people who got less than an 85, divide that by the total. So that's giving you sort of this, what this is giving you, it's the percentage of the class that got less than an 85. Okay. So if you wanted to calculate the percentile given the value, that's how you would do that. So that's pretty easy. I think that makes a lot of sense. By the way, other books do this uh, differently. Okay. So just be aware that there are different ways to do these that sometimes give you different answers, right? It all depends on, on what book you're reading, okay? So, uh, the airport Verizon cell phone data speeds listed below are arranged in increasing order, and they want me to find the percentile for the data speed of 11.8 megabits per second. So, I think before I do my usual thing of just skipping ahead, to where uh, they work that out. We, we could just do it right on here. I think it's easy enough. So look for 11.8, which is right there. Now, they could give me a value that's actually not in here, and that would be okay, because remember it said the number of values that are less than the one they give you. So if they had put 11.7 here, 
this would have worked exactly the same way because the next thing I'm going to do is count how many values are less than 11.8. And it looks to me like there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times two is 20. It looks like there are 20 values that are less than 11.8 out of 50 values total. Okay. So I think what they're getting ready to tell me is that the percentile for the 11.8 would be 40, okay? Meaning that 40% of the data speeds are less than 11.8. And that is what they told me, okay? Okay, so a data speed of 11.8 megabits per second is in the 40th percentile which means that that data speed separates the lowest 40% from the highest 60%. Notice this notation. This is the notation that I like to use for percentiles. When you have a P with a subscript 40, that's how I write 40th percentile. Okay, okay moving on. Oops, okay. All right, here is some notation. I think what they're getting ready to do is tell me now how to go the other way. So if they give me a set of data and they ask me to find the 65th percentile, for example, all right, what value is the 65th percentile, okay? Now, uh, we're gonna wanna take our time a little bit with this. Uh, I just noticed what's coming up on the next slide. It's gonna look a little uh, maybe intimidating, but it's, it's simpler than it looks. Okay, so first of all, the notation, uh, N is the total number of values in the data set. That's usually what we use N for. K is going to stand for the percentile. So like if I was doing, well, right there, 25th percentile, uh, you would put 25 in for K. And then they use this letter L st to stand for locator, which is giving you the position of a value, all right? So what you're about to see is that when I ask you, for example, to find the 65th percentile, the first thing you're gonna do is calculate this number L, and it's going to tell you where to look, all right? Look at, for example, the 12th number on the list. And then, like we mentioned just a minute ago, P sub K is the Kth percentile. So P sub 25 would be the 25th percentile. All right. Now, this thing is kind of hard to read, so I am going to try to zoom in on it. This is telling you how to find uh, percentiles. Okay. So the first thing you do is put your data in order. Your data needs to be in order uh, for this to work, okay? The next thing that you do is you calculate your locator, your position. This is telling you where in the list to look for your value, okay? All right, and of course we're gonna do examples, but like, Basically what this is saying, if I can put this in English for you, is that if you were trying to find the 25th percentile, you would look about 25% of the way through the list. That's all, the, that's all this says, okay? Now, this is where different books say different things. That value, that number L, either will or will not come out to be a whole number. And whether it does or does not come out to a whole number uh, is going to determine what you do next, okay? Let's start with if it's not a whole number. For some reason, I find that simpler. If this locator, this position number, does not come out to a whole number, then you round it up, round it up. Even if it comes out to 12.2, you round it up to 13. Okay, and what that means is the percentile you're looking for is the 13th number on the list, okay? Now, what's 
maybe a little more counterintuitive and not every book does it this way is what happens if the position number is a whole number. So let's say the position number comes out to 18, 18 even. What this is saying here is that if that position number comes out to a whole number like 18, you need to take the average, the mean, of the 18th and the 19th values. Okay? The value of the kth percentile is midway between the elth value and the next value up. Okay. All right, so that is a lot to take in. Okay. So let's do some examples. Okay, so uh, referring to the sorted data speeds below, so that's nice, these are already sorted. They want me to find the 40th percentile, okay? So here's how that works. Uh, first, I calculate my locator, my position number. So that's saying that it is roughly 40% of the way through the list, which gives me a 20, okay? So about, about the 20th value up from the bottom. However, since that is a whole number, I need to take the average of the 20th and the 21st. That's what that said. Okay. So since this number L is a whole number, uh, you go midway between that value and the next one up. So the, in, this, in this case, that means between the 20th and the 21st. So if we bring our list back, the 20th number is 11.6, the 21st number is 11.8. The mean of 11.6 and 11.8 is 11.7. Okay. Now what's interesting about this is that in the first example we did, they asked what is the percentile for the 11.8 and the answer was 40. Now they're asking you what is the 40th percentile and the answer is 11.7, <laughs> so it's not uh, exactly reversible like that. Because again, you know, it's, it's asking you what's 40% of the way through the list. So really any answer, depending on what book you're reading, any answer between 11.6 and 11.8 would be kind of reasonable, right? But you do need to come up with the answer they're expecting, right? Otherwise they'll mark it wrong, right? because they're like that. Okay, okay. Uh, quartiles are just a uh, specific kind of percentile. Instead of dividing your data into hundreds, it divides it into quarters. So really all you need to know about quartiles is that they are specific percentiles. The first quartile is the 25th percentile. It separates the bottom quarter of your data, which means the bottom 25%. The second quartile uh, is also called the median, and I almost always call it the median. Okay. Um, separates the bottom 50% from the top 50%. So separates the bottom two quarters. Third quartile is the same as 75th percentile, separates the bottom three quarters from the top one quarter, okay? So first quartile and third quartile, those are the quartiles I talk about the most, and then the second quartile is the same thing as the median, okay? And again, this is just saying, depending on what book you're reading, uh, there is no universal agreement on a procedure for finding percentiles uh, or quartiles. So if you know if you're using one book and and you're using another book, you might get two different answers, and you might both be correct based on the book that you're reading. Okay. Uh, not going to spend a whole ton of time on this. The only one of these that I can remember ever using myself is the first one, uh, the interquartile range. Somebody asked a little while ago about outliers. 
There is another method for finding outliers other than, you know, the z-score is less than negative two or bigger than two. And that uses the interquartile range. What the interquartile range tells you is what is the range of the middle 50% of your data. So it's kind of leaving out the highest scores and the lowest scores. Uh, think Olympics, you know, where they don't count the judge that gives the highest score and they don't count the judge that gives the lowest score. Kind of reminds me of that. Um, I'm not gonna say anything about these other ones right now until we need them. Okay, and then uh, this five number summary for a set of data, it's basically dividing the data up into quarters, okay? You start at your minimum, and then 25% of the way through the list, you get your first quartile, another 25% of the way through, you get your median, another 25% of the way through, you get your third quartile, and then you go through the top 25% and you hit your maximum. Okay. That is called the five number summary. And it's a really nice way to summarize a set of data. I have occasionally told statistics classes what their five number summary was on their first exam. So that's saying, you know, this was the lowest score and then this score separated the bottom 25%, this was the median, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, okay so uh, I think we'll end this part of the video by finding the uh, five number summary for the Verizon data speeds, okay? So a couple of these are really, really easy. Right, the minimum is uh, 0 0.8, the maximum is 77.8. Okay. So let's see, what should we do next? Okay, we got uh, 0 0.8, you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll just write these back here for just a second. Okay, the next one they're going to find is the First quartile. So the way that you find the first quartile, it would have been nice of them to show a little bit more work on this. You know what, maybe I'll do it right here. Here's how you find a first quartile. First find your locator. So you do L equals, we're looking 25% of the way through these 50 numbers. Oh, perfect. This is the kind of example I wanted anyway. All right. So 25% of the way through the 50 numbers, uh, that would come out to 12.5. Since that is not a whole number, you round it up. Remember, always, always, always round up when you're doing this kind of problem. Even if it came out to 12.2, I would round up. So that's telling me that the uh, first quartile is the 13th number on the list. That's how they came up with 7.9. Okay. And then uh, very similar for finding the third quartile. The third quartile, I'm just going to uh, cheat here a little bit and change just a couple of things. Okay. 75% of the way through the list, that's the third quartile, remember it's the 75th percentile, that would come out to 37.5 and I would round that up to 38. So the 75th percentile would be the 38th value, that's how they came up with 21.5. Okay. And then the median, we've talked about the median, you know, a whole lot before today. Uh, we have an even number of values here, which means I won't have a middle one, I'll have a middle two. So the middle two are the 13.7 and the 14.1. You take the mean of those, you get 13.9. Okay. So your five number summary is 0.8 is the minimum, 7.9 is the first quartile, 13.9 is the median, 21.5 is the third quartile, 77.8. 
is the maximum.